Hi everyone, welcome to Where East Meets West. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and you, I've, you have entered this portal of a beautiful collaboration between Epilogue and America Meditating Radio. As an individual that have been raised in the United States of America with a father who's Indian and a mother who's African, I've often felt that my life has been a bridge between the East and the West. This particular podcast is really meaningful to me because it's about my life unfolding and beginning to offer a narrative to humanity that East and West coming together can create a really beautiful world. My special guest on today's show is Dr. Amit Goswami, an old friend of ours. He is retired professor of physics from the University of Oregon. And while researching the area of quantum physics, he discovered that when quantum physics is formulated within the metaphysics of qualified non-dualism, as in Indian Vedanta, questions regarding meaning are immediately resolved. His work thus integrates science and spirituality. This work has culminated in his most recent book with the physician Valentina Onisor, Quantum Spirituality. In 2009, though, he started a movement called Quantum Activism, which continues to gain ground even now. In 2018, together with his collaborators, he established Quantum Activism, Vishwa Layam. It's an institution of transformative education in India based on quantum science and the primary consciousness. Dr. Koswami is the author of numerous books, most notably The Self-Aware Universe, Physics of the Soul, and God is Not Dead. <laughs> he was featured in the movie What the Bleep Do We Know? and the documentaries Dalai Lama, Renaissance, and The Quantum Activists. It's my pleasure to welcome Amit Koswami to Where East Meets West. Welcome, Dr. Koswami. So glad that you could join us today. Thank you, Sister Jenna. I'm delighted to be with you once again. Mm, I am so happy to have you. One of the fascinating curiosities for me is when a scientist actually has a deep connection to spirituality, to God, and you've been in this particular realm of physics just about almost all your life. Could you tell us a little bit as to what was the attraction to physics for you when you were younger? Well, you know, it was kind of antithetical uh, compared to what I eventually ended up doing. Uh, I was born in a um, spiritual uh, Brahmin family in India. And my father was a spiritual man. Uh, he even was a sort of a guru to a few disciples. Um, so I got an early dose of uh, spirituality between age one and nine. Um, but this was very bad times in India. Partition, uh, we became refugees, so I had to shift and life totally changed. Uh, in that process, when I finally ended up in school, I uh, immediately uh, got into the influence of teachers who um, uh, were very far from spiritual, let's put it that way. And my brother who I was living with, uh, no longer, uh, my father was no longer with me. Uh, so uh, he was anything but spiritual also. So those influences, um, you know, how unconsciously they affect a child. Plus when I noticed that uh, science is a very uh, verifiable uh, way of finding truth, I was very attracted to it. One of my complaints constantly to my parents uh, was that where is the data? Uh, even at, 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 at six, uh, age six, I was challenging that, but how do, we, how do we know it's all Brahman, that kind of thing? So, um, uh, and you know, my father would say, okay, try to meditate, but of course a six-year-old meditation was not the best thing that I could do. So I never did. Um, so gradually a kind of a revolt was being born, unconsciously of course. And then when I noticed that, uh, yes, physics and chemistry, they can give very 
accurate knowledge because they say, okay, hydrogen and oxygen make water, and then they immediately prove it. That was so impressive. Um, and it was like that uh, ever since. So age 11, gradual conversion for about three years, age 14, confirmed scientist in the materialist tradition. Uh, that, of course, immediately speaking, I did not know. Yeah. Only later I realized <laughs> at age 37, what does that want to be? I'm a total materialist. But I could not shake that belief uh, for another 12 years. Only when I had a uh, tremendous uh, creative experience, uh, namely solution of the quantum measurement problem, did I realize, oh, consciousness is the ground of all being. It is all Brahman. <laughs> Can you tell me what that experience was like, Amit? That spiritual experience that you had? Um, well, uh, the there was a spiritual experience, but um, that was also a major thing. Um, you see, what happened was that I had a um, kind of a um, uh, intuition, borderline on insight. But intuition is a better description of it. I was at a conference. I had a very bad day with jealousy. And then at 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, I go outside. So I was at a conference. And this thought unexpectedly comes to me, uh, which is, uh, why do I live this way? So the answer also came immediately that I don't have to. I can integrate my thinking and living, whatever that means, and livelihood. So I um, started looking for physics that will make me happy. The physics that I was doing was so far removed from uh, what we can call life. And relationship was the major problem of life at that time. <laughs> And relationship has this concept of love, whatever that was at that time, I did not know. Uh, it was a certain kind of behavior, and that did not satisfy. So I became interested in, okay, let me just do the practices, no questions asked. So I started meditating. And then in that period, because I was uh, very, very enthusiastic, I mastered the energy uh, for seven days, I did a simple meditation called Japa. You know that. Okay, let's pause right here. Tell me a little bit how you knew that you mastered the energy in that meditation, because I'm sure a lot of our audience would want to find that technique that perhaps you discovered so long ago. Well, it is desperation. Desperation and suffering uh, gives us a lot of energy. I really was desperate. My life was not working, and I was not finding the physics I needed to find. Quantum physics still has not come back to my life yet, um, because everybody's scared of quantum measurement problem. I mean, this is a problem that people have been trying to solve for 60 years, and nobody could. And so, you know, uh, the advice was, don't go there. So initially, I was not going there, but nothing else was making uh, much headway into solving this problem of happy physics. Everything was same thing, nitty gritty little things. And I was not interested in that anymore. I wanted to know the big truth. What is it about? I, I know what that feels like, Amit, very, very much, because, you know, we are not using the soul's potential. And we're not using thought potential. And I think one of the most painful thing as a human being is to live in such a tiny world when God is giving you this expanded, you know, unlimited way of being, not just as a, not only as a physical form, but more so the vibrational form that, you know, your spirit has the capacity to transcend you know our daddy ma daddy janky who you met many years ago she passed away in 2020 on march 27th and 
You know, they've inaugurated a stamp, the president of India with a stamp. Um, a year later, I had acquired a retreat center called the Om Shanti Village in Washington, D.C. And the whole Brahma Kumari and Kumar community has been like on fire, you know, like in service, optimizing the awakening of spiritual power. And as I watch this, I say to myself, it's the potential, they're tapping into that quantum energy of spirit. And I know that sometimes suffering and pain kind of drives you there to say there's got to be more to my life than that. So I didn't mean to like interject there, but I'm kind of really intoxicated about our topic that we're discussing. So please continue because what you're saying is really important. Like how did you get to that place of mastering in your meditation, opening up or popping open your consciousness to seeing the world in a broader view? Yes, this is, this is a question that I, you know, I often ask myself, how could I get that kind of energy? Only one more time I had that kind of energy, second time, even more time, I spent two weeks continuously in meditation, but that time, no such luck as the first time. But let me, let me, let me start. My guess is after this, uh, so many years, that the curiosity that I had about knowing truth that my father and in indirect way, even the teachers did instill in me. Science used to be, when I was doing it, a pursuit of truth. And, uh, you know, materialism was not a dogma yet. I'm talking about 1950s. Um, when I was the graduate student. So uh, that combined with realizing that I have to uh, find love in my life in order to have my relationship straight, gave me two very powerful archetypes, truth and love. One uh, requires the head, other one requires the heart, except that I didn't know what heart was at that time. So there was a handicap. This japa, uh, of course, uh, was a family japa. Uh, my family is Goswami, you, you know already, but for the listeners, Goswami is a um, bhakti-oriented family. Bhakti means devotion. And here the uh, deity uh, that uh, the Goswami clan uh, worships is Krishna. So it was the one of the names of Krishna that I was uh, using for Japa. And um, uh, his mantras uh, work in a very strange way, only in retrospect I can say that. Um, strange way meaning that they have uh, kind of a resonance power. Resonance is a frequency matching with the archetype. So whenever I said Krishna, it matched the archetype of wholeness. All this is in retrospect. I did not do any of it at that time. But the experience was amazing. I did not know the mechanics of it. Later, uh, the research showed how this actually worked in a cognitive way, because cognitive scientists have done similar things, and it does work this way. But the experience was just so amazing. The, what I heard in my early childhood, that if you do this japa, and you do it, you do it all waking hours that you can remember, but of course you have to do your chores too. So what happens is that you keep it in suspension. And you do your chores, but with the intention that let the japa be internalized. And how do you know that it's internalized? While I was teaching, I was looking inside. Every time I looked inside, it was there. It's an amazing experience. This stage is called ajapa japa, japa without japa. You are not consciously doing it. You are doing another chore, but in spite of it, it is going on. And now I, of course, in retrospective, know that it was going on in the unconscious. It was in the forefront of unconscious thoughts. So whenever the unconscious was collapsing using the quantum language. The collapse, the precedent was the mantra, the mantra that I was using for Chapa. 
So this uh, sustained, this curiosity of what is going on added to the already the enormous curiosity plus the suffering giving uh, me a lot of energy that I got to find some answers. That propelled me through and I would not have stopped on the seventh day either. But what happened was in the morning, I go to my office, still doing japa. There's no impending uh, class to teach or anything. And then I thought, uh, I'll take a walk outside. Uh, it looked a bright morning, November, um, kind of nice morning. And I go outside in the sun, in the meadow. And all of a sudden, this experience of oneness of everything came without any explanation, without any warning, just everything seems to be self-consciousness. Uh, it must have, must have been a very deep alignment of your energy, like your soul, your, 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 your body, everything just became so clear and so awakened. And I think that many of us have an opportunity to gain such an experience if we we start. We really start being curious in the right way, in the in sense of what is life about, who am I, who is God. Um, you wrote a book, God is Not Dead, and I'm so curious to hear, like, how did that come about? Like, why did you start writing that, and what, what's the, what was that all about? Well, what happened was again, uh, is, there is a story behind it. I was in Brazil. Uh, giving a talk about God, uh, spirituality really, science and spirituality, actually my usual spiel, nothing uh, special. But then this young man in the uh, audience, he challenges me. He said, okay, I have heard much, but then it all sounds reasonable, but where is the scientific evidence? And I knew what he meant. He meant quantum science is not science, it's theory. Where is the experimental data? And uh, I had just came out of my mouth without any thinking. Young man, I said, scientific evidence for God is already here. What are you going to do about it? That's really the question. So he and I and the audience got into a wonderful conversation about what eventually became quantum activism. So, you know, uh, after that, I felt compelled to write this book. The initial name was Scientific Evidence for God is Here. What are you going to do about it? The publishers uh, didn't think that, that such a big name will appeal. So they uh, figured God is not dead. Uh, picking on poor Nietzsche <laughs> would, would be a better title. Fantastic, because nowadays the world is changing at such a rapid speed. And I think a lot of humanity is actually trying to find meaning or maybe even a connection to God. Now, how does your quantum physics activism, how can that help us to establish a connection with ourselves at a higher level and connect that higher self to God? You know, this is the, the most tragic thing that is happening today, that nobody believes in truth anymore. Uh, so what has happened in science is a particularly good example of it. In 1925-26, when quantum physics was discovered, there was a lot of curiosity because quantum objects don't behave the way objects are supposed to behave. They were not determined objects. They were possibilities. How the possibilities become uh, actuality, uh, this became such a commanding problem to solve because material interactions cannot do it. That was mathematics of quantum physics itself demands that matter and material interaction, if that were the case with the universe, there would be no universe no manifest universe. It would all be potentiality all the time. And in that situation, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, no less than Einstein, a huge toucher, right? Proved that in this domain of potentiality, 
where this possibility wave reside outside of space and time, there is instant communication, which means that potentially all things in that domain can be one, just simply by interacting together. So that concept of oneness was already there in 1935. And then went through, okay, how to verify this? That is the big question, of course, before verification, uh, one should not uh, trust even uh, quantum physics, which has been indirectly verified by many, many experiments. So we had to wait till 1982 when this idea itself, that yes, objects can communicate at a distance, but instantly without signals, proving that there is another domain, there is oneness in that domain. The experiment was done successfully, 1982, repeated so much that even graduate laboratory students could do it. Even so, even so, today, this was 1982, this is almost 19, uh, 2022. Just imagine, 40 years later, still people don't get the message that there is another domain, this domain is oneness, and this oneness has to be consciousness because out of which comes our subject and object. Out of which comes our consciousness got to be this domain, there is no other answer. And now even neuroscience has proven that the brain not only has a local way of organizing things, we can call that, okay, that could be a brain phenomenon, but imagine this, the brain also has a non-local way that it, operates. We have verified that by looking at the brain of people who, like yourself, meditated for years and years and years. Not just, you know, I, I was lucky, seven days, classic. These people meditated like every day for five hours for 20, 30 years. And the brain actually changes to a permanent state of expansion, quantum state where the brain waves themselves show that the brain is synchronous all over the brain. This is unbelievable. There's even a book out on this data. And still, people um, would have a questioning. I think because people are still grappling with experiencing who they really are, that they really are souls. And with the whole energy of the soul inhabiting itself in the brain, imagine how it's sending so many signals, right? And if we can just heighten our capacity of consciousness, uh, the world will be so much of a better place. You've got a book that um, you've got a book out that is how consciousness creates the material world, and you speak a lot about consciousness and how thoughts, man you know, create manifestation. And I know that a lot of people, especially from the movie The Secret and other, you know, formulas like Abraham Hicks of um, The Law of Attraction, a lot of folks focus their thoughts now on acquiring material possessions. One of my areas of looking at this is how do I acquire a good character? How do I acquire truth? How do I acquire peace and purity in my nature? Would you be able to speak to me on that in terms of how consciousness can really manifest things in our lives? Yes, this actually, um, since then, uh, uh, since this self universe, I have done much work on this very subject because this is one of the crucial subjects. So I became interested in creativity because obviously uh, it, is, uh, it is not as easy as the uh, movie secret uh, tries to tell us. I mean, it, it's just nice to hear um, that uh, to be enthusiastic, yes, okay, uh, the secret is we have to kind of learn to be, and that part, uh, this is part of the secret, indeed. I mean, that's what you teach or I teach uh, about meditation. You have to uh, slow down and learn to be. That's part of the secret, though. The rest of the secret was convinced it has to be uh, meditation, creativity, and all this. So I wrote a book on creativity, did a lot of research, and uh, that research, fortunately, is uh, kind of more, much more accepted than the experiment that I was referring to. Because creativity is not directly contradictory to the 
materialist point of view. There are ways of wiggling out. Uh, so uh, that was the first thing. But then um, I also realized that one can augment the creative process by a simple process of intention making. I call it the three I. The crucial thing in our experience, we have sensing, feeling, thinking, and intuition. Intuition is the crucial experience and people don't usually have that experience. Many, many people have never in their life have the experience of intuition, or even if they had it, it was such a small glimpse that they ignored it. So uh, intuition is really ESP. So we have competition going on. Material world send us sensory signal, and then consciousness sends us extrasensory signals. And that's intuition. If we are not sensitive to intuition, we never uh, know this world of consciousness. This is where most scientists are. They have never known in their life what intuition or creative insight is about. They're rational people. They do their theories with rationality and experimental data. So this, this realm, unbelievably, is opaque to all these people. And, and, and so uh, the basic uh, process, uh, I believe now, is that not only the creative process, but also a process of inspiration, because that expands our consciousness. Expands means that I can include more. I can be open to more than my belief system in those moments of inspiration. And then I make an intention. Yes, I want to manifest this. And the basic part of that intention is the synchrony with the movement of consciousness. Intu intention has to have a purpose. Purpose comes to us via this DSP of the archetypes, love, beauty, justice, truth. These are examples of archetypes. And if we are open to this, that's, this is what the intention does, then intuitions are much more easy to come to us. So um, it's the process that uh, I teach and the, then the creative process. We have summed it up in all in seven eyes. You have to hear it. Inspiration, intention, intuition, imagination, incubation, insight, and implementation. Seven eyes process will get you to science of manifestation. Perfect, because you've just highlighted so many aspects of what the soul's capable and if we can use the soul's energy, we can definitely create so much wonder if we're just open to it, you know? Well, look, I could talk to you on and on and on, but due to time restraints such as life, but I'm going to take you through what I call my spiritual rapid fire. So I'll give you an option of two words, and I just want you to choose one and share with us. Ready? <laughs> All right. God or religion? God. A movie or a book? Okay. Book. Coffee or tea? Ah, coffee or tea. Tea. Reading or writing? Um, writing. Dancing or swimming? Um, <laughs> can I take both? <laughs> <laughs> Do you prefer silence or speaking? I prefer again um, uh, silence mostly when I am um, into trivia, then I prefer silence. But if I am invited to speak with relevant stuff, then I love speaking. Definitely, if you're on the stage, you don't want to stand there in silence and then tell everybody this is quantum activism. <laughs> 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 Dr. Amit Goswami, thank you so much for joining us on Where East Meets West. You've been a delight, and hopefully we'll get you on again to tell us more about the, all the amazing things that you're doing and to educate us more on how we can use our spirituality for better good. Thank you so much.
So everyone, that was the Dr. Amit Goswami. As you can see, we have taken so many treasures from his conversation today, and I know that I've opened up to a lot of eyes right now. You know, there was a time that you thought the eye of the ego was a big thing, but he's talking about the eye of the soul, the insight, the intuition, just all of these amazing capacity and potential that we have. You know, I have to tell you that when I look at my own life, one of the things that drives me the most is to see what can God do through me. And even though I don't always get it right, I'm always open to seeing the possibility of how God's light can actually work through the eye of the soul and take not only my life forward, but everybody who is around me and connected to me as forward, if not even ahead of me. So may this conversation be one that really triggered a lot of thinking for you that you open up your intuition and your insight and your wisdom and that you recognize that God really isn't dead. The question is, what are you going to do in terms of your relationship with the divine? Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Where East Meets West. We wish you all the very best. Feel free to drop us a message on the epilogue website or on America Meditating Radio. Take care, everyone. Be well. Mm -hmm.